Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Tell your neighbor Shabbat Shalom. Amen. I'm always excited to jump into a message when we're in a series like we've been in and we're just excited about the, the word of the Lord today. We want to say Brahim Habaim to all of our first time guests. Let's welcome those that are in the house today and online or those that are just returning back to the house of God. How many know it's been a real sketchy time for a lot of people to feel that they can trust a physical building? But how many know the ecclesia is not the building but the people? So we're grateful that you are healthy, wealthy, and wise. And God is blessing you with the blessings of Abraham. We've been in a series called Counsel in Crisis, where we started with week one, talking about good counsel cancels bad choices. We went on in Mishpatim, the portion of the Torah that talks about the rulings of the judge, that our decisions are the results of our discernment. That was a message that I taught from that second Torah portion of this series. And then we had Truma, or the portion called Teruma, and we talked about building on a firm foundation, and then week four we talked about wisdom is found by those who seek it. Last week was a real good one, where is your goal going? We talked about goal to build God's ark of his presence versus the goal that could be used for a golden calf. How many know that's an image of false worship that should be replaced by true worship of God for those that worship, worship in spirit and in truth, they don't worship an idol? I mean, no, we don't worship the Torah, we don't worship images, we worship God. But we use these things as reminders of what God has done, where he's been, what he's doing, what he will do, and what we should be studying to get there, amen? And so this week, as we looked at Kitisa last week, we're looking at this week, Parshat Vayakel, the sixth lesson is, wisdom always stirs the heart for action. Say that with me. Wisdom always stirs the heart for action. So we have been in this series avoiding the pitfalls of life by applying God's counsel to our daily steps and choices. That's kind of where we're driving this message today. It's coming from the book of Shemot or Exodus 35, 1 through 38, 20 is the Torah portion. We have the extra reading called Shkalim, Exodus 30, 11 through 16 for the Shabbat today is called also Shabbat Shkalim or Parshat Shkelim, which goes back to last week's reading of Kitisa, and actually draws just five verses from the text. Then we have the prophet reading, which is Melachim Aleph, 1 Kings 7, 13 through 26. And finally, we heard from Corinthian Beit, or 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11, on generosity and giving, because all of the tabernacle was built by the generosity, the free willed offerings, the hearts that were stirred, and the spirits that were willing to give to God. Amen? Amen? And that's the way it is for us today. We have been using a theme verse from Psalm 1, 1 and 2, or sometimes 1 through 3, on two different versions. And the expanded Bible says, happy or blessed are those that basically don't listen to or walk in the counsel of the wicked. But we contrasted that with the fact that they love in verse 2, they love and delight in the Lord's teachings, his laws, and instruction. Now we know for laws and instructions, those are two words translated from the word Torah. One correct and probably one not so appropriate. The Torah doesn't mean laws. What does the Torah really mean? Instructions. Now, in those instructions, are there laws? Absolutely. But they're really the teachings of the Lord. As you compare it with the Tree of Life version, that says, happy is the one that's not walking in the advice of the wicked. But it says in verse 2, his delight is in the Torah of Adonai, and in his Torah, how often does he meditate? He meditates day and night, because he delights in it. Do you delight in reading the Word of God? Then you should delight in reading the first oracles or principles of God, starting with the Torah starting with the top 10, those commands. Like today, we're going to learn about the command of keeping Shabbat. But we're going to see how it applies to wisdom to build God a house so we can gather. Proverbs 13, 13, the book of Mishlei has also been a primary verse we have leaned upon, that whoever despises the word or counsel of God brings destruction upon himself, but whoever reverently fears and respects the commandment of God is what? Is rewarded. So how many ready to get in the word of God today? Let's take a look at Exodus 35, 1, the beginning of our Torah portion. It says, Moses assembled. Vayakel is the verb, the same verb used for the noun 
which is an assembly of people. So it says he assembled. Literally, he gathered or assembled. It can be translated. All the congregation, Edat Israel. It says the congregation of the people of Israel, B'nai Israel, and said to them, these are the things that the Lord commanded them. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest. Yes, a Sabbath of solemn rest, it says here in this version. Holy to the Lord, whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire in all of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. We said the tradition of lighting candles even came from this idea of before the Sabbath starts, when? Friday at sundown, possibly 18 minutes prior, is the measurement of the Orthodox or Hasidic community to make sure that we're not at the sundown part yet. So they say 18 minutes, the same 18 minutes for bread to have leaven that causes it to rise. Same. If you make matzah in, eight, in less than 18 minutes, the chances are there will be no time for the leaven to rise. So 18 minutes is a good measure, they say. Um, so they say that the command to kindle no fire is actually represented as a reminder by Shabbat candles that we light before the Sabbath begins. And we let them burn out as a fire to warm up food can continue to burn before the Sabbath and continue to warm through the night. You can have warm food. Some people even in Israel, when they do a cafe, uh, set up for tour groups, they will actually keep the food warming on low all night long to the next day, which you notice on Saturdays, the food is not always brand new fresh food. <laughs> it's rewarmed food from the previous day. It's the double portion of the previous day. So sometimes you're like, okay, I can't wait for Saturday and sundown so we can get some fresh hot dinner, you know? <laughs> and that does happen a lot on Israel tours. How many have been to Israel and have experienced like those big tours and you know, you notice the Saturday food is just like, wait a minute, is this leftovers? <laughs> it's the food that's been warmed up basically. It could have been made just for that, that day or that night, uh, but it is warmed over until sundown where they can start making fresh hot food again with fire. Again, that's one way to keep this command. It might not be your way, but we have to respect other people's way of doing things. Amen? But guess what? When in Israel, do like the Israelis. When in Rome, do like the Romans. You know, it is what it is. Look at verse 4. And Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take among you a contribution to the, to the Lord, whoever has a generous heart. What, what's, what's the heart like that gives to the Lord? Generous, generous heart. So notice, in Hebrew, it's nediv libo, is generous heart. And we'll look at the Hebrew in, in a minute. Jumping down to verse 10, it says, Let every wise-hearted man, so it goes from generous heart to wise-hearted man, among you come and make everything that Adonai has commanded you. So we see here that there is a generous heart, a wise heart. Look at verse 21. Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit was willing. Say willing. willing. Say willing spirit. willing spirit. In Hebrew, that is nadiva rucho. Rucho. Rucho is from ruach. Rucho means his spirit. Nadiva actually means a willing spirit. It's interesting that Patricia's Hebrew, uh, Hebrew name is nadiva. Nadiva. So we see here that that name means to be willing, to give a free will offering, something that is not forced or commanded. The same thing our new covenant reads said. When we give and we're generous, it's not based on being coerced or, or forced or compelled to do it. We give freely, amen? amen? All these offerings were given freely as a gift. It says, they came and brought Adonai's offering for the work of the tent of meeting and for all of its services, as well as the holy garments. Even the garments they wore were free-willed offerings by the people to clothe the priesthood. Wow. This is where the concept of giving and part of the giving going to providing for ministers comes from. It's a principle. It's a pattern. It's not commanded per se. But you have to give to the Levites in this generation because there are no Levites at the temple because there's no temple in Jerusalem. But it's a principle based upon a pattern. And how many know many times things in the New Covenant are based upon the pattern? Like don't muzzle the ox that treads the corn. The, don't muzzle the ox because if he's going to tread the corn and work for you, he should be able to eat from the corn too. 
So the minister that does the work of the ministry, he should be able to eat from the giving and the provision of that ministry. And that's what that principle is based upon. That's what Paul uses as a Torah principle that's a pattern. So is it okay to provide for ministers of God that they don't have to work secular jobs, can devote all their time to, to the service of God? Absolutely. A workman is worthy of his hire based upon that Torah principle as a pattern. Now, if you think about this concept of having a willing spirit, the moment I read this, guess what I was thrown into? I was thrown into Yeshua's words to the disciples. Here's a picture of Yeshua praying. Keep watch and praying so that you won't enter into temptation. For the spirit is what? Willing. Our human inner spirit is willing, but what is weak? Flesh. Our flesh. The problem is never with God. The problem is never with spiritual motivation as much as it is our flesh that doesn't want to execute the vision that God has given through Moses and the prophets and the apostles. They're sharing truth that we don't want to apply all the time. We kind of get lazy in our flesh. We know we should read our Bibles. We know we should pray. We know we should worship. We, we know we should share the good news. Why don't we? Oh, we get lazy. Our flesh gets weak. I don't want to go to them. They might judge me if I you know, share with them about my faith in Messiah. You know, they, they're going to reject me or I'm going to look funny like you know, one of these you know, crazy holy rollers, radical, you know, fanatics and fanaticism and you know because we look down on fanaticism right we look down on the islamic world we look down on it in the jewish world at times we look down on it in the christian world everyone can be considered a fanatic we even can do that in the political world fanaticism but there's a difference between between being a fan and a fanatic how many know you can be a fan and rah, 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 and root on your team, that doesn't mean you have to be a fanatic to where your whole life is absorbed by one focus with the wrong purpose, right? Putting too much energy into one thing. We got to be careful that we're not becoming fanatics, but we're becoming fans of God. <laughs> Fan the flame. I should use another verb usage of that word. Uh, the idea is that our spirit is willing but our flesh is weak. And the Bible says that the people that gave, gave willingly. Their spirit was willing. Look at the Hebrew here. The first term we encountered was willing heart. Nediv libo. Nediv. Nediv libo. We see that nediv libo means to have a generous heart. A generous heart. We see that this is a, an understanding from generosity or willingness to give. So to have a nadiv libo, which means um, one whose heart is willing or generous, is not by coercion. No one's forcing you to do it, but you have a willing heart. We also see the idea of a willing spirit, nadiva rucho, which means that we have a generous spirit. So notice the generosity of heart leads to a generous spirit. I'm good, actually. I don't need the... I'm good with the... Yeah, thank you. So we see that the third thing we see in the text, um, we didn't actually look at the verse for it, but it also says everyone who was wise-hearted or has a wise heart. Hacham lev. Lev is heart. Libo means his heart. One's heart being willing versus one's heart being wise. To have a wise heart, a hacham lev. Hacham is used for the scholars of Israel. Someone skilled with wisdom. You know, you talk about the Torah, and you talk about the skill of studying the Torah. We have to rightly divide the word of truth, which means we have to study to show ourselves approved. Someone who has studied has skill, has skill to study the Torah. We'll look at some examples of that as we keep studying today. So what do we have to have first? A willing what? A willing heart. A deeply bold. A generous heart. We also have to have a willing what? Spirit. Nadiva Rucho, to have a generous spirit. We also have to have a wise heart, Chacham Lev, which means to be skilled with wisdom. And finally, the last one, as our title says, we need to have a stirred heart, which is Nisa O Libo, to be lifted up or stirred up. So literally, Nisa O, Nisa O means to lift up. How many know? When you talk about nasa, to lift up, nisa, we talk about even kitisa last week. 
to lift up, to lift up the heads. Naso et rosh b'nei Israel. He was to lift up the heads of Israel. This literally means you need to be lifted up. The Bible says he's the glory and lifter of your head. You need to be lifted up. You need to be encouraged. Moses was told to encourage Joshua, to encourage him, to strengthen him, to make sure that he was able to have some of the same responsibility, not all of the responsibility of Moses, but some of it, so that the spirit that was on Moses could come upon him. How many know God wants us to lift each other up? Yes. We need to be encouraged. And we lift each other up. We stir each other up to good works. We stir each other up to be motivated to do the work of God. I want to speak to those that are watching online and those that are in the house today that feel like you've been a little discouraged. You've been a little frustrated. And guess what? Because you're not stirred up, you're not walking as, with a wise heart, using wisdom as a skill. And because you're a little discouraged without having your heart stirred and you're not feeling wise, you're not willing in spirit and you're not willing in heart. The first thing that happens is people stop being generous. And I'm not just talking about money today. I'm talking about your time, your talent, your treasure, yourself, to give of yourself. Now, some of you are hilarious, cheerful givers. I mean, you give of your time, talent, and treasure. Some of you ladies, the food you're giving on Saturdays, the Oneg is just exceedingly, abundantly above all I could ever ask or think. There was a season where we had to plead, beg, borrow, minus steal. We had to beg people, please bring some food for our own egg, please. We'd have to actually go take some offerings, physical money, go buy food. Now we don't have to do that anymore. We don't even schedule it even once a month. We literally have own egg every week. Like we literally want to be like the, uh, the, the, the priests and Moses and Aaron that just say, tell the people to stop giving so much because they're giving over and above. I want to applaud you today for your over and above generosity. You don't know what love in my heart it stirs up because I'm so encouraged when people are serving with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their strength, whether you're a part of a synagogue, synagogue like this one that's messianic or an orthodox synagogue or a Christian church. When you serve with all your heart, you put your heart into it, people feel your heart. Do you know what an ancient rabbi who wanted to be nameless said words from the heart? Penetrate the heart. How about actions from the hands? People know when you're being generous, when you're being loving. They also know when you're doing for an ulterior motive. But if we can stay pure before God, do things with a pure heart, man, who would not want to be a part of this fellowship? Who would not be welcome when they walk through the door and everybody wants to get to, everybody wants to know your name, right? I mean, you know, it's like you walk through the door and you're like, oh, you're back. I saw Joy walk through the door today. I'm like, where you been? We missed you. And she began to tell me the whole Megillah of all the things that God's been doing in her life with all of her coworkers and, uh, and um, also her, um, the people that she takes care of and with care, uh, in home care. And I was just you know, amazed at some of the stories that she was had being persistent to share with the people that whether they're a, uh, just a normal person that maybe believes in God or maybe someone that's a, uh, a doctor or scientist or someone who believes in just pure knowledge who says, I don't believe in God. And she's persistent to keep pouring, 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 pouring her love. And I just reminded her as I reminded uh, all of us today, let's just tell them how, why we believe. Let's not force others to make them believe. Let's just tell them why we believe. Share your testimony. Because when your testimony testifies of the goodness of God, people want to have some of that goodness because there could be some things in their life that are not so good. And they're putting up a wall because they're hurting. And when you share the goodness of God, they might weep, they might cry, they might even get angry for a minute. But then that seed gets in that soil of their heart and it gets watered by the Holy Spirit. Next thing you know, I want some of that joy you have. I want some of that peace. I want some of that love you have. You've got so much to give. Don't stop giving your love. Let's be wise-hearted, which means willing-hearted and willing-spirited and Let's be stirred up to stir others up. Amen? Amen. Look at Psalm 51, 6, or verse 8 in the Tree of Life. The Amplified reads, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part of my heart. Say my heart. My heart. You will make me know wisdom. You see, knowing wisdom is the principal thing. To get wisdom in all you're getting, get understanding. 
Because when you have wisdom, wisdom, if you're wise-hearted, as it says here in the Hebrew, if you have a chacham lev, you're wise-hearted, it will not only stir you up, but it will stir others up. Because when you ask God, ask God to stir up your heart with wisdom. Ask God to give you wisdom. He will give it to anyone who asks. Amen? So I love the psalmist David. This is actually when he's repenting of his sin, sleeping with Bathsheba, right? He says, and in the hidden part of my heart, you will make me know wisdom. God will make you know wisdom when you want to know the truth. Look at Psalm 51, verse 12. In the Tree of Life version, it says, Create in me a clean heart. Come on, say that with me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. King James would say, renew a right spirit within me. But this word right means to be resolute, to be firmly planted, to not be moved by every wind of doctrine, not be moved by emotion. It means to be firmly footed and to have those hinds feet, to be firmly established, to know that nothing's going to move you. Because see, when you have a willing spirit and you have a willing heart, you know that having that willing heart is going to not only make you generous in heart and spirit, but you're going to have a wise heart that is skilled in wisdom and nothing is going to move you. Because look what David said. He said that he wanted God to renew a steadfast spirit within him. Verse 13 says, do not cast me from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh from me. Watch this. Verse 14. We never read this one in context. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a what? Willing spirit. If you will keep a willing spirit, you might not have the mental capacity to know how God's going to do it, to know how to do it. But if you're willing. How many know it all starts with just first being willing? Amen. Just like hearing the gospel, just be willing to listen. And sometimes your heart's changed just by being willing to come to the house of God. Yeah. You know, just inviting someone to the house of God. Can you imagine if we all actually targeted someone to invite them to come? In one week, we would double. Because the people gave their time, talent, and treasure. The people gave of themselves. They were willing-hearted. They were wise-hearted. You might know someone that's hurting. Bring them. On a Saturday, say, I want you to hear a message that's going to really encourage your heart. You're going to learn about counsel and wisdom and understanding. And I, I, I feel like from the times we've talked, you need some of that in your life. So I'd love to invite you. Come sit right next to me. Meet me at this time. We'll have some coffee. You can let me know. I'll get some donuts, <laughs> some cookies, something. You know, just because, you know, we want to start inviting people and having that welcoming spirit. Amen? That willing spirit that makes people feel like, this is my home. I can come here anytime. I don't have to be a, an official member and go through a membership process. Sure, we probably should do that. But if you're not willing to come, what good is a membership process? If you don't really want to be a part of a congregation, amen? The people were willing to come to the congregation under Moses as we should be in Yeshua. Look what Job 38, 36 says. Who put wisdom in the heart or gave understanding to the mind? Who do you think that is? God. So we have to first realize, point number one, that wisdom stirs our hearts by inspiration. Wisdom stirs our hearts by inspiration. The Holy Spirit inspires us, which means he breathes on us. It means to be God-breathed. Wisdom stirs our hearts by inspiration. I'm going to go back to Exodus 35.10, just that one verse. It says, let every wise-hearted man among you come and make everything that Adonai has commanded. Notice that if you're wise-hearted, you have no problem keeping God's command. You know why? When you don't want to do something that God's commanded you, it's because you don't understand why he's asking you to do it. So if you get the wisdom, you go, oh, now I'm, I've got some wisdom. I understand why he wants me to do that. There's times where I counsel couples, me and my wife. And we'll share with them, you know, different principles. And then they're like, no, we don't want to do that. That's not for us. And, you know, no, we're going to take a different path. Okay. Then they come back to us and they're like, our life's falling apart. This and that. But remember we talked about, you know, some principles? Yeah, but I didn't want to do all that. And I just felt like, you know, that's not for us. And next thing you know, after the fact, problems come. And then we go back to the principle if that it w they would have applied it, it would have avoided that whole problem. And they go, now we know why you were telling us not to do that. 
because we see what happens when we're not walking in wisdom. Do you understand that the commandments are not to be grievous or burdensome? They're holy, they're righteous, they're spiritual. And if we apply them, it's because we're wise-hearted. That's why I always ask God, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand. Hearts like Solomon that ask for wisdom and understanding to keep his commands. Look at Exodus 35, 24. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver and bronze brought out an eyes offering. And every man that had acacia wood for any use for service brought it. Look at 25. Also, all the women, all the ladies say, hey. <laughs> say hello. All of the women who were what? Wise-hearted, spun with their hands. You know, it's so funny. I think it was Caroline that uh, left me a message. I didn't get to check the message, but it was about um, a tapestry or some kind of, of uh, representation by sewing for the 12 tribes. She asked, you know, uh, do I want it made? And I wanted to say, yes, always. Because <laughs> anytime anyone uses their ability to make me a challah bag or napkins to use for challah, let me tell you, it's just such a, it's like icing on top of icing on top of icing of the cake. It just makes it sweeter. The cake's sweet by itself, but to add that little extra icing on top. You know, it just makes it sweeter when you give of your talent to God. Amen? Amen. How many have talents you've been sitting on that you want to start giving to God? Whether it's here or somewhere else, God wants you to give or use that talent. It says that they not only were wise-hearted uh, and spun with their hands, it brought, they brought what, ha um, what they had woven the blue, the purple, the scarlet, the fine linen. These are the garments of the priests. These are the colors of the priesthood. All the women whose hearts stirred them up with what? Wisdom spun the goat hair. You know God's got to give you wisdom to know how to do these things? You're like, how'd you learn how to do that? Well, God gave you wisdom. You're going to have to search for it and ask for it, but God's going to give it to you if you ask, right? I love the fact that even in the New Covenant, you have Paul talking to Timothy in Timotheos Bait or 2 Timothy 3.10. He says, you, however, closely followed my teaching, just like closely following the teaching of Moses or following the teaching of Yeshua. Notice the step is you've got to follow teaching, right? He says, you also have to follow my manner of life. How many know a disciple follows the manner of life of their rabbi? Also, their purpose. How many know you have to know your purpose? If anyone's going to follow you, you better know what your purpose is because they need to discover their purpose, but they're looking at you to see if you have purpose in mind. How about faithfulness? How many of your faithfulness is a great way to inspire, encourage, to stir up somebody, to inspire somebody as they see your faithfulness? How about your patience? Now, I haven't always had patience. In fact, if you pray for it, you're going to have some problems come that will force you to use patience. It is a fruit of the Spirit, but how many know sometimes we don't always use the fruit that God gives us? And I've had to learn over the years to be more patient. At times where I'm always in a rush on Shabbat, and the Lord tells me sometimes, slow down, be more patient. I actually fell last week because I was trying to run and go do something, <laughs> jump in front of uh, Patricia, Patricia's grandson, you know, to get to the door, and I fell on my backside. And I got a scar to prove it. Because I've got to learn to be more patient. Sometimes everything doesn't have to happen when, when we think it needs to happen. I don't have to be in a rush all the time. I'm guilty of that. I'm being honest. It's a confessional booth. Yom Kippur is down the road, but I'm just telling you. I haven't been always so patient. I want you to forgive me for not being patient with you. Being more patient. If I've ever been in a rush, forgive me. Because I want to be more patient. Because I want to be like Paul, a good example to the young Timothys, to the young sons and daughters of the house. I apologize. If someone's watching online, I apologize for not being more patient. That's, a, that's a, not a gift. It's a fruit that's grown over time. Amen? Amen. How many know we could all be more patient? Amen. I love this. He says, how about your love? Man, we've been talking about love all day. Just get me a little teary-eyed. I was telling Patricia this morning that you know, we were talking about memories of lost loved ones, and I was saying that my wife saw a little video of her mom who passed last year. Sometimes I can't even remember how long it's been, and she'll remind me, like, hey, it was the anniversary this month. And she got a little teary-eyed, and I was like, 
man, do I hug her? Because my wife's so strong. She normally doesn't need all that. But just being there in a moment, just to not jump on my computer and just say, honey, I remember that too. That's love, to identify with someone's pain. If some of you have lost a loved one, when people can't identify with your pain, it's a lack of love. Melissa, we understand what it's like to lose a loved one. And you don't need us just then, you need us now. And this is your house, and this is your spiritual home, and we are your family. We're here for you. And you ladies, especially the ladies, surrounding her with that love. Today, fellowshipping with each other like we are real brothers and sisters. Not just, hey brother, hey sister in the Lord. No, no, no. No titles and fronts. Let's be real with each other. Let's get to know each other. If there's something about you that I don't know about, please share it with me. If there's something you don't know about me and you want to know, ask me. Get to know each other, because that's showing love. Are you hearing this today? Yes. I love this because he says perseverance. Man, we're going through two years of a pandemic. We've had a lot of perseverance, but we need to press on with more perseverance because the enemy has got us distracted instead of sharing the good news of the gospel. We've been focused on the news of the signs of the times. That's exactly what the enemy wants. The end won't come from the signs of the time. The end will come when the gospel is preached to the whole world. That's when the end will come. That's when Messiah is waiting. He's waiting for us to rise up, be stirred up, to do the good works, to share the good news. Amen? Amen. I love this. He says, you, however, continue in what you have learned and what you have become convinced of. For you know from whom you have learned and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, or we could say the Hebrew scriptures, that are able to make you what? wise, those Torah readings, those prophet readings, make you wise, leading to salvation through trusting in Messiah Yeshua. Because what's the purpose of the Torah? To lead you to Messiah, to lead you in the path you should go, to lead you in the way, the truth, and the life. So when you see him, you recognize him. Not just to know where he was born and what miracles he would do, but his ways. How do you know he's the real Messiah? Because the Torah told us, we have found the one. <laughs> Come on, Philip tells Nathaniel. Andrew tells Peter, his brother. And they say, we found the one that the Torah was talking about. Paul's telling Timothy, we found him. And you keep reading those Hebrew scriptures. They make you wise. How many know at this point, there was no New Testament written yet? This was written down after the fact. When, when he was a child, Timothy, there wasn't any new covenant yet. When Timothy was a child, he was growing up reading the Hebrew scriptures. That's why it says sacred writings, the Torah and the prophets. Are you with me? Yes. Look what uh, verse 16 says. It says in the same chapter, chapter 3, all scripture is what? Inspired by God. You want to get inspired? Get in the word. Man, I, I had someone the other day tell me, Rabbi, there's not a day I, I, I'm not, that I'm around you that I don't get inspired to read the scripture. I said, good. It must mean that I'm passionate about the Word of God. So if my passion rubs off on you and you get passionate for the Word of God, then you know what? It's not that I'm doing my job, because it's not a job for me. It's a joy. It's not a job. It's a joy. If I was not a rabbi, if I was not a shepherd or a pastor, if I was not a Bible college teacher, if I was not a mentor or a life group leader, guess what? It, it would have no bearing on me as a young boy loving the word of God with my dictionary and my encyclopedias and looking up every word in Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, and I was not even old enough to go to Bible college yet. But I was so in love. I delighted in the law of God. And if it shows good... But it's not based upon you. I'm not doing this. So you think, oh, he really knows the word. Oh, he's really passionate about the word. No, I'm passionate about it because I'm impassioned by my God. Amen. He inspired me. When I read it, it inspired me. I wish everybody could read it with eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. But until they read it, they won't get inspired. They just need to read one verse that just hits them. Like a rock, the head of Goliath. <laughs> it'll either take you down or it'll pick you up. You're either going to get stronger from it or you're going to get convicted by it. Either one, that inspired word, look what it should do. It should teach us with teaching. It should reprove us 
with correction. It should restore us. It should train us in righteousness. That's what the Torah does. It's a training in righteousness. It's an instruction in righteousness. So that the person belonging to God may be capable, fully equipped for every good deed. Same verse in the New King James says, it's an inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. How many know a student, a disciple is not above his teacher or his rabbi, but everyone who is perfectly trained or equipped will be like his rabbi. Yeshua didn't spend three and a half years with his disciples for them to just say, oh, he's gone now, what are we going to do? For a moment, they felt that way. Like, he told you this was going to happen. There's some work to get done. He didn't just die. He rose from the dead. He told us he would. And when he did it, guess what? They put everything on the line. They dropped every net, put everything on the line to go spread the good news until one moment when they went back to their old fishing industry. And nothing was going to work because you can't go back having the knowledge you have now. You can't go back to what the time period where you didn't have that knowledge. Once you know, now you know. We always say, if I knew then what I know now, things would be different. Well, you can't ever go back to when you didn't know. Oh, I didn't know. That hurts your feelings. No, I told you the last time you did it that hurt my feelings. I told you not to do that. I told you that makes me uncomfortable when you do that. Oh, I didn't know that. You never told me. Yeah, the last time you did it, <laughs> I told you. It makes me uncomfortable. You know, sometimes we, we don't have healthy boundaries because we're not paying attention. People give us not only body language, they tell us verbally sometimes. Sometimes it's the hurt emotions we feel. We sense it like, man, did I say something to my wife that's making her kind of like, hmm, get your own meal today, you know? Right? No, I mean, like there's something in the air, right? That's the way love is. It's the opposite freshener in the air. I won't go there, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Ezra chapter 7 verse 6. It says, this Ezra came up from Babylon. Where did he come from? Babylon. Babylon. He was a scribe skilled in the Torah of Moses that Adonai, the God of Israel, had given. The king granted him everything he requested because the hand of Adonai, his God, was upon him. I want to be an Ezra. I want the hand of God upon me. How am I going to know that the hand of God upon, is upon me? I'm going to study that Torah and get skilled like a scribe. I'm going to write out every Hebrew letter. I'm going to learn every nuance of it. I'm going to share it because I'm learning it and I'm passionate about it. And God's hand will be upon us and even kings will grant our requests. That's what a man or woman of God can do when they're skilled in the word of God. Amen? Amen. I'm telling you, our pastors, our teachers, our leaders, our rabbis, we need to get skilled in the word of God. So the hand of God can be upon us so the kings and people of authority can re honor our requests. There's nothing God will not do for a man or woman of God. Amen? Amen? When you are studying the word of God, you get skilled, you know your word. You're not backing down from some person that says there is no God. No, I know, you can, I know that I know that I know that I know there's a God. Let me tell you why I believe. Let me tell you why I put my faith in him. Let me tell you why I'm no longer hopeless. Because I've got a God who gives me hope. Hatikva. He gives me the hope. He gives me that hope inside me. And there's no way that you can turn that around for me. Because to every man, I'm going to give an answer for the hope that lies within me. That's what we have to get skilled about. In fact, Paul says it this way to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3.10, according to the grace of God which was given to me, look at this. He says, I'm like a skilled master builder. I've laid a foundation and another builds on it, but let everyone each consider carefully how he builds on it. Paul's basically saying, Pharisee, don't come in and mess up what I'm doing with the Gentiles. I built a foundation with them. I had to start from the bottom. I built from the ground up. They didn't know the Torah. So I had to build from the ground up, line upon line, precept upon precept, just like a Jew in Babylon, like Ezra. He had to learn and get skilled in the Torah. How many know in Babylon you couldn't study the Torah? But until you come out of Babylon, then you can get skilled. The church needs to come out of Babylon. Synagogues need to come out of Babylon. Congregations need to come out of Babylon. We, as the believer, need to come out of Babylon. Babylon, like Egypt, tells us we can't worship our God, we can't talk about our God, we can't study our God, like Esther, who couldn't mention his name publicly in Persia. And the Persians overthrew the Babylonians, just like the Persians were overthrown by the Greeks. Greeks were overthrown by the Romans. Every worldly system wants to shut us up. They don't want the name of our God pronounced. They don't want the name of our God lifted up. We need to be stirred up and encouraged. 
We've got skill. We've got wisdom. We are wise. We are generous. We are givers. Come on, somebody. We are people that know the word of God, and there's no one that's going to turn us around. Oh, I hope you're stirred up today. Because then you find out wise hearts, my second point, wise hearts develop their skills through consistent motivation and meditation. If you're going to be skilled, it must have consistent motivation and meditation. In fact, we talked about last week how in Exodus 31, that it was in verse 3, the Spirit of God that gave these artisans wisdom and understanding and knowledge for their craftsmanship. What did they give? They gave their gold, their silver, and their bronze. They gave all of the wood. They gave all of the things that these artisans, like Oholiab here in the text, who was wise-hearted and had skill. It says they were able to do everything God commanded because they had skill. If they didn't have skill, you can't complete a task of God if you have no skill to perform it. Oh, I want to be a preacher. You do. You better study the Word of God some skill. And I, I remember youth camps where young kids would go, I'm called to the ministry. I'm like, in the next few years, they'd fall away. And you'd, preacher's kids, and you're thinking, what happened? They got a calling, and the enemy heard that call. They knew the call, but they didn't do anything with it. They didn't study to show themselves approved. They didn't sit under someone and get trained. So therefore, the enemy snatched them like a seed snatched from the wayside soil. Those some of those ministers' kids are not even serving God today. Sad. Because we have to pour into this generation. Look at chapter 36, verse 1 in our portion. So Bezalel and Aholiab are to work along with every wise-hearted man in whom Adonai has placed what? Insight and understanding. Look at verse 2. It says, all of the wise-hearted men in whose minds Adonai has put what? Wisdom, or New King James says, in whose heart the Lord has put wisdom. You have to understand that the text, like the Tree of Life version says minds, but actually the actual Hebrew says heart. Because God will not put something in your mind if you don't have a wise heart. Because he doesn't want to fill our mind with a bunch of wisdom and knowledge and facts if our heart's not right with him. Because all you do have, you have an arrogant, knowledgeable person who can't humble themselves in the presence of God because they know so much. My generation, we got lost. Because we didn't always have leaders that were consistent, like Moses leading Joshua's. Like Paul leading Timothy's. And like Yeshua leading Peter, James, and John and the other disciples. We need consistency. Young Joshua's need consistent motivation. Our sons and our daughters need to be motivated. But we don't speak words that motivate. We point out the wrong, but we don't show them the right or encourage them when they do right? Why would they want to continue if we're not motivating them? You see, we found out that wise hearts develop their skill through what? Consistent motivation and meditation. In fact, if you look at 36 verse four, it says then all the skilled men were doing the work of the sanctuary, the skilled men. Look what happens in verse five. It, it, they said to Moses, the people are bringing m much more, much more than enough for the work of this construction that Adonai has commanded. Verse 6 says, so Moses gave an order and they proclaimed it throughout the camp saying, neither man nor woman make anything else as an offering for, for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing more for the work material they had was sufficient for all the work with much left over. It reminds me when Yeshua fed the 5,000 or the 4,000 in another setting, it says there was so much food, baskets of food of the fish and the loaves that were multiplied left over. The 12 disciples walked away with 12 baskets of leftovers, which was still very fresh bread. Bread that they helped break. They were able to save the other broken pieces that they broke with their own hands that wasn't shared with the people. The very hands that broke it, they were the same hands able to receive it. Don't muzzle the ox that treads the corn. If I break the bread, I should be able to eat the bread too. I'm gonna break some bread after service in a few minutes. Guess what? I get to eat it too. You do too. If you do the work of God, you get to benefit. Your service to God should be beneficial to you. Shouldn't be burdensome to you, amen? Look at Proverbs 49.2 or verse three, depending on your version. 
It says, hear this, all ye peoples. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world. Look at verse 4. My mouth speaks wisdom. Watch this. My mouth speaks wisdom. My heart's meditation is understanding. If your mouth is speaking wisdom, that means your heart is meditating on the things you're speaking. When you speak out loud, read the word out loud, and you say encouraging words out of your mouth, it get, allows you to meditate. Here's the, also the problem. You'll also meditate on negative things when you're talking negatively. In fact, you will premeditate very nasty things to do to people when you're thinking about it. When I get a chance, I'm going to... No. We don't want to use our meditation for bad. We want to use it for good. Because Psalm 19.8, we studied this last week, that the Torah of Adonai is perfect. It's not imperfect. It's perfect. And it restores our souls. Uh, but uh, you notice that the reference to the Torah is also called the precepts. It's also called the mitzvot or commandments. It's also called the, the very source of the fear or reverence of the Lord. And verse 11 says they are more desirable than gold. As we talked about, where's your gold going last week? And it says it's sweeter than the drippings of the honeycomb. Look at verse 15. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable for you, Adonai, my rock and my redeemer. Orthodox Jews pray this every day. When they're saying the Amidah or the 18 benedictions, this is a verse they close out with every single day, sometimes more than once a day. I actually say this. I learned this as a child in King James. The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be so before, before you, O Lord, my God, my rock, and my redeemer. I remember memorizing it, but I didn't know what I was memorizing because I wasn't meditating on it. I was memorizing it. Memorization's here. Meditation's here. What good is it to memorize scripture if you don't meditate on it? Because you need to know the wisdom behind it. That's when it gets applied to your life. Look at Hebrews 10, 23. It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to what? Motivate one another. To what? Acts of love. We've been talking about love all day, right? We're talking about that heart stirred up for action. He says acts of love and good works. Remember, we don't want to do bad works. We want to do good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together. How many know we're meeting together today? As some people, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We sang the song today. Hu yavo, right? He's coming. And he who was and is and is to come. Yavo. We sang that today. We danced to that today. You see, the idea of motivation is to stir up acts of love and good works. When you read the word of God, that's what should be stirred up. See that, that, that little gold dust coming up from those scriptures. You know, that's gold right there. That's the, the, the presence of God is coming from what you're reading and your study because you're drawn near to God closer as the Messiah gets ready to return. See, our points today have been knowing that wisdom stirs our hearts by inspiration. But then our hearts, if we're going to develop that skill in our life, we need motivation and meditation, right, in the Word of God. And finally, last point is, wise thoughts and choices always lead to wise steps and actions. I want to read to you uh, from the book of Kohelet, which is Ecclesiastes. Uh, we're going to read chapter 7, verse 24, because we want to talk about those thoughts and choices. It says, this state of wisdom is far off and buried very deep. Who can discover it? Solomon says, I then turned my what? My thoughts in the direction of knowledge. He says, my mind sought to search out and seek what? Wisdom. And the reason why these things are as they are only to realize that it's, it is foolish to be wicked and madness to act like a fool. You want to motivate people to good actions? To not act like a fool? Or to do foolish things? The only way we're going to do it is we start turning our thoughts in the direction of knowledge. I love that. Watch this. Wise thoughts and choices always lead to what? Wise steps and actions. Actions. That's what we want. We want to act in a way that the Torah commands us to act because we're walking in the way, the truth, and the life. 
so the idea that Solomon's saying here in the book of Ecclesiastes, book of Kohelet, he's saying you've got to turn your thoughts in the direction of knowledge. If you also look at David, his father, and his words in Psalm 119, 133, he says, direct my footsteps in your word and let no iniquity get mastery over me. So if you direct your thoughts, turn your thoughts in the direction of the word, in the direction of knowledge, then you can turn your foot when it wants to sin. You can turn your thoughts and you can turn your actions. But if you don't change your thoughts, you won't change your actions. You've got to turn your foot in the right direction. You've got to let him direct your footsteps. King James says, order my steps in your word. Order my steps. 1 Peter 1.13 says, so brace your minds for what? Action. Say that with me. Brace your minds for action. In other words, get your, your minds ready for action. The King James says, gird up the loins of your mind. Put that, that belt of truth on so you can take that long flowing tunic that they would wear in those days. Tuck it into your belt so they can run because with a long tunic you'll trip. Like long flowing thoughts that need to be tucked in to the belt of truth. We can all have long flowing thoughts, but if we don't tuck in our tunic, we're going to trip over our own thoughts, our own selfishness, our own a way of thinking, our own confusion about the situations. We've got to brace our minds for action or literally gird up the loins of our mind. I love if you look at verse 22 of the same chapter, it says, Now that you have purified your souls in obedience to the what? To the truth, leading to sincere brotherly love. What have we been talking about all day? Love. It's one of those examples our young people need to see in us. He says, love one another fervently from a what? Pure heart. Haven't we been talking about that? That purity of heart? When we fellowship today, let's have purity of heart. Let's just bear our souls to each other. I don't mean tell all your dirty secrets. I don't mean like give us, you know, a view of all your dirty laundry. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying love each other sincerely. I'm going to be more patient. I'm going to be more loving. I'm going to be more faithful to my call when I learn to slow down and enjoy my fellowship with my fellow believers. Amen. So would you stretch your hands for the blessing? Yivarecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai p'nav elecha v'hunecha Yisa Adonai p'nav elecha v'asim lecha Shalom. Amen. May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you. May the Lord Adonai shine his face upon you, be gracious to you. And may the Lord Adonai lift up his countenance upon you, give you perfect peace, and sar shalom the Prince of Peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah we pray. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. God bless you today. Shabbat Shalom and Shavuot Tov.